Who am I? Who are you? That's a big question, right? We live in a world where we're trying to figure out who we are, how we're defined, what makes us important. It's this whole conversation about identity, right? We live currently in a culture that has made a huge shift. It actually happened a couple hundred years ago. It's amazing how many shifts in thinking come. It's been said philosophers rule the world. They just do it 100 years after they're dead. And the shift came from this idea that who we are is determined by something bigger than us, something outside of us, that we discover who we are by discovering things about God. Well, the shift became this idea that we discover who we are by looking inside. And, and currently, the culture has gone all in on this. We, we tell people to, to discover yourself, to seek yourself, to celebrate yourself. We've even gone so far as to, to start believing that we can create ourselves, that whoever we want to be, we can be. And whatever we think is important, how we feel in a certain day, this is who we are. And, and what we haven't realized is that I think that, that, that this is a huge amount of pressure on a person. I mean, when I can be anything and anything defines it, well, I'm just going to get lost in the wind. I actually think the increase of anxiety we experience as a culture is in part to the fact that we have no footing, we have no grounding, we don't know who we are. And so we as Christians want to take a step back and return to King Jesus and ask him. He actually said something really radical, really, really powerful about this. He said, he said you know what? If you want to save your life, you're not going to discover it. You're not going to create it. You're not going to, you know, embrace who you are and all those kinds of things like that. You are going to lose your life. So if you want to save your life, you're going to lose your life. And the person who loses their life for me, in me, by me, is actually going to find their life. So that, so that we as Christians believe this crazy idea that who we are is defined by King Jesus. And the way to figure out who we really are and therefore how we should live is determined by having this obsession with learning about him, focusing on him, making our life about Christ. This is so much of what the Apostle Paul means when he talks about this this concept of being in Christ, this, this thing of being hidden with Christ, this thing of dying to ourself, that's the language the Bible uses, and coming alive to Christ. This is, this is what Paul means when he gives that invitation to live in Christ. This is understanding that when we stand in Christ, we, listen now, put away what we used to be. We don't celebrate it or discover it or double down on it. We, we put it away and, and, and we put on the new person, the new self, choosing the way of Jesus. And in relationship psychology, they talk about the danger of becoming enmeshed. The idea is that, that you so get enmeshed with a person, the, another physical person, uh, an earthly person, that you don't know where you stop and they begin. It's actually really unhealthy. We're actually going to talk about it we teach on relationships next year. But here's the deal. As Christians in Christ, we want to become enmeshed. We want to be the kind of people where people don't know where we stop and where Jesus begins. That's the way it was in the early church. You know how Christians got their name? They didn't get together and say, you know what, let's have a little contest. Brainstorm names. What are we going to call ourselves, people? It wasn't like that at all. Instead, people started calling them little Christs. And to hear about, you know... Gaius? Yeah, he's with those people who follow that way about that Jesus guy. I know, and all he talks about is Christ. And you know, he doesn't go to the temples anymore. He says, why not? Well, because he's in Christ. And, and you know what? He's with his wife and only with his wife. He doesn't sleep with other women. And why? Well, because he's in Christ, he says. And you know what? Christ, Christ, Christ. They're a bunch of Christians. And so we were called a name of derision that we said, yeah, that sums it up. That's who we are. And there's a deep need for us as Christians not to buy into the narrative of identity. And so this week, we want to talk about what it means to enter into a hidden life, a life where we find ourselves when we lose ourselves in Jesus Christ. The, the thing we're really wanting us to see this week is this. 
To be in Christ is to live in Christ. Look at this, by putting away the old self. Paul's gonna say it even more clearly than this. He uses the strongest possible words. It's not about discovering yourself or creating yourself or renewing yourself. It, it's about losing yourself to find yourself. This is the, the Christian paradox, the, the Christian mystery of being in Christ. So, so we're in Colossians. We've gotten to chapter three. Uh, finally, wow, we're making some progress, finally. And, 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 and this week we're talking about the, the, the mindset, the attitude of what it means to be in Christ. And understand that, that what we're doing here these next weeks, and particularly what we're going to do in the last series right around Christmas, is the harvest. It's the fruit. It's the, the things that are true because of the work we've done. These are the implications of what we believe. Remembering that the first part of Colossians was heady, and it was theological, and it was big. But at the end of the day, those things matter. They have implications. And that if we really believe them, and they translate to our lives, they're going to change everything about us. So he starts with this little phrase. Again, these little phrases, these prepositions and conjunctions are everything in Colossians. He says, if then you, okay, if then you. So that's based on the assumption that everything we've said, if this is true, if the things we've said in chapter one about Christ are true, then there's implications for that. And we've really been saying generally, Four big theological things. I'm going to repeat them again. And some of you are saying, you're really repeating this a lot. Well, you know, maybe you'll get it if I repeat it a lot. The Bible actually says that teachers are supposed to patiently reiterate the words of truth. So we're supposed to be repetitive. So there. So, 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 so these four big things are just simple things. That there is a God that defines all that is good and beautiful. So there is something good and beautiful, is something worth chasing. And the second thing is that this God is a creator God. So everything that is seen and unseen came from him. And so the pursuit of studying and learning about the creation is an act of worship. And, and this creator God has made the pinnacle or the, the, the highest point of, human, of his creation, humanity. He's created humans in his image. And so this says something about your worth and your significance and why you matter and your identity. Identity. You would settle for an earthly identity when you've been given an identity as a son and daughter of God in Christ. And, and it has implications about why you matter. And it has huge implications. We're going to see this again here in a couple weeks. The huge implication is how you treat people. That the greatest indication of what you believe is how you live and specifically how you treat people. The absolute pinnacle benchmark of that is love. And so as a follower of Christ, if you really believe those, those things, then, then you will live as love. And that's the fourth theological point. The fourth theological point is that if we're creating the image of God, the ultimate example of what it means to be the image of God is Jesus. He's the exact representation. He's the icon of God. So our obsession is to learn about him, to follow him, to apprentice him, to be like him. We don't want to be focusing on ourselves. We want to be focusing on him. We want to be learning him. We want to be asked the question, what would Christ do if he were living in my life? What would it look like for me to be more in Christ? What does it look like for me to wake up in the morning and put on Christ? Well, it usually starts with having to put some things off. It is a mindset. It's a perspective. And it is a joy. It's a glorious gift of self-forgetfulness, that I'm no longer obsessed, focused about how I look and image management and how I seem and, and what my, my identity is. And half the time for us, we will settle for what we seem to be, how we look to people or how we even look to ourselves rather than who we are. And so this idea of coming and finding ourselves in Christ is glory. So he says, if then you have been raised with Christ, so if all the implications are true, that Jesus is the icon of God, he's the firstborn from among the dead, that he rose from the dead, he came into our life, he's given us the Holy Spirit, that we are in the process of having been saved, we're going to be saved, we're in this process, and we're going to be saved, and we're being saved right now. If we're in this thing of we have been raised with Christ, we're being raised with Christ, and ultimately we'll be raised with Christ. If then our hope is in the resurrection of Christ, seek the things that are above. He says, quit worrying about identity and I, I have money and so that makes me matter. I have fame that makes me matter. I'm friends with the right people. Or I say the right things or I'm intelligent or I'm accomplished. All that gets set aside. Instead, I think, seek the things above, okay? Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And so my focus becomes the person of Christ. My emphasis becomes the person of Christ. My, my 
bearings, the place I stand is in Christ, on these things of Christ. This is a conscious understanding that I'm shifting my perspective. It's about priority. What matters? What I have now temporarily or what's eternal? Jesus said it, you know, this way. He said, he said do not store up for yourself treasures on earth. Okay, this is Jesus 101. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth. He said, why not? Because you can't keep it. Moths ruin it, you know. Uh, thieves steal it. It corrodes. It wears out. I mean, some of us, you know, you know, we build a new house. You know, the minute you put up a wall, it's falling down. Gravity is not your friend, okay? Some of us getting older understand that, right? The minute you buy something, they're making a newer version of it. You know, the minute you think that you're secure and your portfolio is all set up, something happens in the market and all this paper wealth you think you had is now gone. And so he says, she says, don't set your heart on things below. Don't, don't seek the treasures you can't keep. He says, but there's another kind of treasure that's eternal. And it has to do with how you live and how you treat people. It has to do with, with what your focus is, what your joy is, what your anticipation is. You know, don't put your, your, your focus on this life that you can't keep, but instead put your, your, your focus on Christ in heaven who seats at the right hand of God. This is a priority choice. And then there's a mindset that comes. It's amazing. I was going to say most change comes in mindset. I just think all change comes when we change our minds. That's why the, the essence of the word repentance is not changing behavior. The literal word metanoia for repentance is to change your mind with the understanding that that leads to a changed behavior. So, so look what he says here. He says, set your minds on things that are above not on things on earth. And so I'm regularly and routinely recentering myself. I learn spiritual practices where I open this book and remind myself, say, oh yeah, that's what's important. I learn to spend time with God in moments of prayer throughout the day so that I don't get swept up on things of the earth. I get recentered. It means that I establish community and groups around me of other people who have the same kind of mindset and we journey together. It's, it's setting your minds on things above. It starts with a mindset that this is what's important. And it's amazing how easy we can get, our minds can be consumed with other things that we think are important, whether it be our jobs or our families, or golly, uh, are the Packers, for goodness sakes, which is not a big problem this year because I'm trying to forget about that. So, 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 so we set our minds, okay? This is a mindset thing. He says, look at this, we die to find the hidden life. Notice he doesn't say, we discover, we create ourselves, you know, we embrace ourselves. And you know, one of the things, I just, to say it, and this is going to frustrate some folks, but whenever we come to a person and they just say, I just I feel so lost, well, you just need to accept yourself. You need to just love yourself. You need to just, you know, um, um, come to this place where you just, you know, create who you want to be and be it. You know, you just need to be yourself. The Bible says we need to die to ourselves because when we start with the assumption that we just need to be ourselves, we kind of assume that we're pretty good. We're probably good enough. And, and honestly, I really believe that when we say that to young people, here's where it gets a little dicey, we're saying you're enough and you're not. We're not. But in Christ, we are. That's why the invitation is so important. That without Christ, you know, we are broken, we are hurting, we're wounded. And when we find our identity in anything else, we are losing our life. And so to, in a sentimental notion, teach people to double down on that, we may be doing great harm. Look what he says. He says, for you have died. That is to say, when you come to Christ, who you used to be, doesn't, you know, just, you know, uh, you know, just change. That person died. That's the picture of, of baptism, that the old person died, they're buried in the waters of baptism, and a new person emerges. He said who you were dying, and that means what was important to you, what you prioritized, how you look at things, that died when you came to Christ. That, that Christ not only became part of your life, you're going to see in a minute, he becomes your life. He says, for you have died, and your life, look at this, is hidden with Christ in God. You become enmeshed with Christ. Christ becomes your life. This isn't a side gig. This isn't something you just put on to come to church. This is who you 
are. This is your identity. This is the call to be in Christ. When Christ, look at this, who is your life. We just say that again. Christ, who does not simply give you life, is not part of your life. He is your life. When he appears, look at this, then you also will appear with him in glory. That is to say, and literally in the Greek, what it says is that when Christ is revealed, when he shows up and we see him for who he is, we too will be revealed. That is to say, we will see who we really are. So even in this life, we don't really actually figure out who we are. We actually invest in Christ and we we start discovering who we are in Christ. (coughs) But when he comes back and he reveals, we will see all that we are. The Bible describes it in the most wonderful ways. It says, you are like God's masterpiece who God put up on a shelf. He says, we've been raised up with Christ and seated with him in heavenly places so that in coming ages we may display his glory and his grace. That is to say, what we will be in Christ in that place will be so glorious that for all eternity, people will look at what Christ has made us and said, that's a work of art. That's who you are. Why would you settle for anything on earth? He, 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 he tells us over and over again that, that in heaven, this is one of the things that comes out in the book of the Revelation, is that in heaven we will be given a new name known only to ourselves. And so it's not like, Jesus is going to whisper, here's your name, don't tell anybody. It's not that kind of thing. Okay? Instead, it's a way of saying who you really are who you really are, what really makes your significance, will be given to you, will be defined by Christ, and that will be your essence, and that will be something that only you will understand and only God will understand. You will know yourself and you will be known by the eternal God. It's an incredible promise of identity, of significance, of meaning, of purpose. And, And here's the thing, in this life, the key to moving towards it is to forget about ourselves, is to die to ourselves, to focus on God and the benefit and the, and the blessing of other people. So when in Christ, who is your life appears, you also will appear. When he is revealed, what you will be revealed will also be, look at this, in glory. And your destiny in Christ is so glorious. That's one of the things that for years I've trying to get people to just see. That the, the church for years has been talking about identity in Christ. And some of you aren't really listening to me because you're like, I know I've heard about the identity in Christ thing. Basically what you've heard is, in Christ, I'm good enough, I'm loved, I'm accepted, okay, that's fine. But here's the problem. When you only take that kind of identity in Christ, there's a part of you that knows, yeah, but inside I'm not there. I mean, I'm still got brokenness and hurt and and, and pain. I got sin, I got stuff. So even though, you know, I'm called this, I'm not really this. And so my identity, okay, is great and it helps me but I'm still fighting what I know what's going on inside of me. That's why it's equally important for us to talk about our destiny in Christ. Because right now, we've been given an identity, but it's a now and a not yet. It has been fulfilled, but it's also been promised. And so here's the deal. When we understand we have an identity in Christ, we also understand that the Spirit is working on our salvation. It's perfecting our salvation. So we not only will be just positionally in Christ, we will actually be in Christ. So so. In eternity, our identity will perfectly match who we are. We will be people who are good people from whom good things naturally flow. We will be precious and strong and noble and good and everything glorious, not just by designation given to us by Christ, but in actuality. See, we would settle in Christ for just being called good. Listen, Christ is actually going to make us good. He is going to redeem us and make us into something glorious. His destiny for you is glory. That's why it's important to have a strong identity in Christ, but also the hope of a strong destiny in Christ. That is what's waiting for us. It's glory, you see. Watch this now. He didn't stop. He says, this is what we're supposed to do now, okay? If it's true, get your priority straight, get your head straight. It's all about Christ. And then get your action straight. He says this, put to death. Strong language. Therefore, the therefore connects everything he said so far. Paul's not making a bunch of points in the book of Colossians. He's really only making one point in Colossians, what it means to be in Christ. And if the big theological things are true, it trickles down to how we live. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And so let's get specific. Sexual immorality. That is to say, the perversion of thinking that physical sexual satisfaction will make me important, will give me identity, will give me satisfaction. 
in, in just 10 minutes of examination of that, particularly some of us who may have gone down some of those roads before, just know it leaves me empty, it leaves me isolated, it leaves me alone, okay? It steals my identity, it makes me so I don't know who I am. And so he says, put to death all sexual morality, all its kind of ways and all its expressions, and he says, fight it. If it's a struggle in your life, he says, it's worth a fight. It's worth a struggle in Christ. It's put together away sexual immorality, impurity. Impurity is this idea that we take special things and we muck them up with impure things. We take like a brand new set of clothing and we go play touch football in the backyard with a bunch of friends. Or we dump, jump into a lake with them. It's, it's actions that are inappropriate for a follower of Christ. And it has to do with how we treat people, how we talk, mindsets, what we watch. He says we, we have to take those things off. So sexual morality, impurity, it could be greed, it could be any number of things. Passion. So it's not a, 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 a question of God doesn't want us to be passionate or he wants us to be boring. The word here for passion is here misplaced passions or what, what Augustine called disordered desires. That is to say that we take things that are good and we give them way too much priority. And this can be something like, you know, I want to go and I may, want to make a living. I want to provide for my family, which is good, right, and appropriate, and more of us need to do it, okay, right? But then all of a sudden, but I want to make more, and I want to be defined by that. And all of a sudden, this good thing gets out of control. Or something like family. We say, you know what? I want to raise my family. I want to teach them to love God. I want to be a good parent. But then all of a sudden, we try to control them. We try to keep control of the whole situation. We start living for our family. Our family becomes a God. When passions get disordered, okay, the problem is not the passion. The problem is misspent or misplaced passion. Evil desires. That is to say, become aware of things you want that you ought not want. I want that person to hurt. I want that person to just be not okay. I, I, it's amazing the permission we give ourselves to, to hate people, to wish harm on people. It, it could be something like, you know what, um, I, I just want uh, wealth so that I can control this person or, or whatever it may be. When, I, when we set our heart on evil desires, we, 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 we Focus our mind on earthly things. So, so what do you do? Say, okay, I've got this evil desire in my life. What do I do? Well, you take a step back and you drag it out into the light. And you bring it to Christ. You say, Christ, this is in my heart. I just need to make a way from it. I give it to you. I change it. I, I just want you to have it. And listen, it doesn't just melt necessarily. Sometimes it's got to melt. You know what really helps me is when I go to a friend and I confess it. I mean, uh, when I was a, a young pastor, it was a very small church, and I was always jealous of pastors with bigger churches. Now, I would have never admitted that, couldn't even admit that to myself. And I remember once I was in a group of pastors, and, and um, one of the pastors who I just super respected, actually Kendall Anderson, a lot of you know Kendall Anderson, and, and I just, he was just like a rock star to me. I just, Kendall was just so awesome, and he knew my name, it was an amazing thing, it was just awesome, okay? And you see all the insecurities in me and all the things in me. And so I remember we're in this meeting and another pastor of a smaller church said something about a program that he had going on in his church. It sounded like a really cool program. And Kendall said, with an incredible amount of humility, it was true humility because he didn't even realize what he was saying. It wasn't pretentious. He said, man, that is amazing. I'm so jealous. I wish we were doing that in our church. And I thought to myself, wow, he just said that. And, and, and it showed me a door of opening, one, to become aware of things I was cherishing in my own heart that were evil desires. And then I was able to begin to start expressing that in those groups. And all of them really shrugged and said, yeah, this is the thing. We all feel this. And, and all of a sudden, it started losing its grip over me. That, that some of these things that, that get disordered passion become evil desires. When you bring them into the light of God and then bring them in the light of community, man, you put them to death. And, and covetousness. You know what covetousness is? It's, it's, it's envy. It's a desire to have something. It's actually one of the Ten Commandments. Do you realize that? If you're going to make ten rules of things, big ten big rules, okay? We're all brainstorm. Covetousness probably wouldn't have made the list. But the scriptures teach it. We just had ten days to talk about covetousness. It describes it as the source of almost all human conflict. 
that you have something that I want. More than that, I think I should have it. It's not fair you have it. I should have it. I covet this, this wife, this house, this money. And, and he says, when you become aware of that, it is the seeds of ingratitude and discontent and contempt. He says, when you see it, call it out in the light. Rebuke it, okay? You're storing up for yourself treasures, reputation, whatever it is, credit. You, you, I mean, when I say credit, I want credit for the thing that, that I've done that no one sees. This covetousness kills us. He says, look at this, which is idolatry. That is to say, covetous is an indication that you want something more than God. And you're willing to ruin relationships and ruin yourself over it. He says, on account of these things, look at this, the wrath of God is coming. He says, these are the things that create the chaos and the war and the evil and the broken relationships and the breakdown of society. He says, as followers of Christ, we put those things to death. We say, those are of this world, and my mind is not on the world. My mind is on the things above. So I'm actively working to, to put the old man down, as Paul says in Corinthians, to, to keep him in the grave, as it were, to, 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 to die to who I used to be. He goes on. In these two, you once walked. So he talked about that in past tense. He said, do you remember that this used to be who you were? This used to define you. Look at this. When you were living in them, this is defined who you were, okay? But now, but now, but now, look at this. You must put them all away. And then he, he gets to the heart of heart issues. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. He says, when you recognize that you're carrying this anger, you're carrying unforgiveness, when you recognize that you have wrath, what is wrath is? Wrath is when I feel I have the right to call judgment on someone or to punish someone or to put someone in a category or to give them a name. It expresses itself in talk. And what's obscene talk? It's disordered talk. It could be anything from slander to gossip to unfair criticism to, to harsh jokes to immoral jokes to sexually explicit jokes that we joke about and we laugh about and we let them come out sometimes. But this is the thing. When we joking let them out, it reveals a little something about our heart. And he says, these are the things that we're supposed to put away. That when we are in Christ, the more we're in Christ, the more these things lose their grip on us. Look what he goes on. He doubles down. He says, do not lie to one another, okay? Do not lie to one another. Instead, have this radical commitment, not just to technically tell the truth and thus be dishonest, but I want to be open. I want to be transparent. I want to recognize that there's a huge freedom in me being honest with people in my life, seeing that you have put off. Look at this. We've put off. You've put off. Just imagine taking off some old, nasty, smelly clothes, okay? Just put off the old self with its practices and with its practices. Notice with its practices because these are the things we do, okay? Okay? The things that are the implications of our mindset and our thinking. And it put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of the Creator. So again, he comes full circle back to the theology. He says, You're putting on this new self, and it is renewed. How's it renewed? When you learn more about the Creator. When you learn more about Christ, about his perspective, his opinion, when you become an apprentice of Christ, when you learn it as a person living life, so that you go through something that requires a deep level of forgiveness. And you knew forgiveness was important when you received it, but you started realizing the power of forgiveness when you had to give it. That is you having your relationship renewed in an experiential knowledge after the image of the creator, who the best example of that is Christ. And so if these things are true, then again, we set a new priority. I set my mind on things above, a new mindset. And then I actively look at my life and say, what is part of the old that needs to be put off? And, and it's amazing to me that Paul starts in issues of the heart. He talks about anger and wrath and malice and immorality. And, and I'm going to put those things away. I'm going to drag them into the light. I'm going to confess them to God and to save people. I'm going to lose those things on my, on my life. Now, let me just give you a little spoiler alert. Next week, oh man, we are going to talk about once you take something off, once you put it off, you put something else on. You put on Christ. We're going to talk deeply about what that is. And let me just say this, just this. Oh, please hear this. The vision God has for your life is stunning. What you could be if you were more fully a person who lived in Christ, who actively in your mind, in your heart, in your behavior, in your devotions, 
Put on Christ. And the things of Christ, you would be the kind of people that, that people would say, I'm going to go talk to them because they're wise. Why do you say they're wise? Well, because of the way they live and the way they respond, and the way they go through things, and the way they handle things. I mean, people were terrible to them. They said terrible things about them, and they didn't say terrible things back. They chose a path of love, and now that things have played out, it's shown that they were right, and their character is seen. They're very wise. They're very good. You know what? I did something to that person, and I was just a jerk, and I was horrible, and that person could have hurt me. They could have taken my job or my reputation. You know what? They just came to me, and they talked about it, and they forgave me. Why did they do that? Well, they're just very wise. See, the vision for what you would be, what you would actually be, and we desperately need to get identity from what we are, not from how we seem. The vision for what you could be if you took off the old and put on Christ, put on the new. We're going to see that next week. The vision he has for you is absolutely beautiful. So here's the question for this week. What do you need to put off? Okay, maybe for you it's more fundamental than that. You say, you know what, I recognize, I just, you know what, I've got misguided priorities. There are things in my life way more important than Christ. I just need to confess that. I need to refocus on Christ. I need to get back into this thing of prayer and devotion, okay? What's your mindset? Now, I am so focused, I'm just obsessed with something on earth. That's what I think about all the time. That's where I put my desires and my passion. And let me just ask you, is that making you happy, fulfilled, or is it stressing you out? Okay? And you say, I just need to confess that. I need to bring that to Christ. And, and, and maybe for you then, it's just about, you know what? The way I've been talking, you know, I, I'm not going to just power up and not say anything. I'm going to say, where did that angry comment come from? Where did that sarcastic dig come from? Where did that nasty thing I said come from? What am I cherishing in my heart? Because the Bible says, from the mouth, the heart speaks. See, it's an opportunity for you to come and to renew. Now, so this weekend, we are going to have communion. What a perfect time to have communion. Because what communion is about, it's about an opportunity. It's an opportunity to be renewed in Christ, to come back again to the central message of Christianity, which is what the first part again, Colossians, is all about. We have these elements. We have a cup and we have bread, okay? And the cup has juice in it, and it represents the, the wine that Jesus gave at the night before he died. He gathers his disciples, and he said, this cup represents the blood of a new relationship, your relationship with me where you can be in Christ. He says the blood of the new and an everlasting uh, uh, covenant. That is to say, it's an eternal covenant forever. And so any other commitments or covenants you've made on this earth are temporary compared to the covenant I have in Christ. So this is the blood of the new and the everlasting covenant. It represents my blood that will be spread, uh, uh, spilt on the cross. And when I die on the cross... My blood will be poured out. My life will be poured out. I do that that you might have life. He says, do this and remember me. Remind yourself of me. Refocus on me. Set your minds on me and the things above. The book of Hebrews said, set your, minds on, uh, set your mind on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. So this is a, a refocusing. And then he takes the body and, and the blood, I'm sorry, the bread. And the bread represents his body. And, and that is so full of layers of meaning that this idea that, that this bread should remind us that God Almighty in the incarnation, we'll celebrate this as Christian, Christmas, became a person. And he, he physically lived. He, he was cold and he was hungry and, and he felt physical pain. He felt disappointment. He felt wonder. He felt awe. He totally immersed himself in the human experience so that he would understand and that we would see an example of what it means. And then he did things. He lived things. He taught things. And what he did in the body, listen, listen, listen. What he did in the body is what we should do in our bodies. And so he said, when you remember that my body was broken, it was nailed to the cross, it demonstrated service and sacrifice, not worried about how I looked, but worried about what the world needed. He said, when you, you do this, do this in remembrance of me. It's his admonition. He said, the things you see in me, you do also. See, this is what it means to be in Christ. It's a focus, it's a priority, it's a mindset that articulates to an examination of how we live. And then it's an opportunity. The book of Corinthians tells us that whenever we have communion, we should examine ourselves. We should look deeply inside of ourselves and we should just say, you know what? What is not right? What do I need to listen now? Put off. 
okay? I've got some unforgiveness. I've got some wrath. I've got some anger, and I'm carrying it. i got some focus on some things on earth. Some of us are still got election hangover. Too close? Too soon? All right, anyway, all right? And, and we're angry about it. We're hung up on it. And, and listen, they're important. We vote, all those things. But at the end of the day, that's stuff of the earth, okay? We have kingdom citizenship. And, and so it, it just might be saying, you know, I'm just going to call it out. I'm going to give it for God. I'm going to confess it to someone later. But I'm just going to, I'm going to put something off today that I might be more fully in Christ. And so this is what we're going to do. We're going to have communion. You'll notice that communion's up here. We're not doing, you know, mick communion this week, you know, with the cups and the little thing that was so hard to get open, you know, that thing. Okay, we're grateful for that. And, and I would like to just, this feels like the end of COVID for me. I don't know if that works for anybody else. Does that feel good? That feels pretty good to me, yeah. And I know we're still doing it. We're not completely done all that, but here's the deal. Um, um, we're gonna have communion where you come forward. Historically at James Well, uh, we had this perspective. We wanna come, we wanna come forward to Christ, to the cross. And so we're gonna do that. And so here's the deal with communion. Uh, for us, communion is a symbolic remembrance, a recentering of Christ uh, in a way that we feel like Christ meets us in a very real and powerful, renewing way. And so it's, it's, it's a really important uh, time of recentering on Christ. This celebration of communion is, is what Jesus gave us on the night before he died. It has been the defining, defining uh, part of worship for Christians from the very beginning of the very earliest churches um, 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 till now. There are hundreds, I guess hundreds of millions of people around the world, tens of millions certainly around the world who will be sharing in this communion and Christ will be meeting. And so we are united with them when we do it. And so here's the deal. Um, we don't have a lot of rules about who can have communion and who can't have communion at Jacob's Well. So this is basically what we say. If you are a person who believes like the first part of Colossians, the simple stuff that Jesus really lived, he really died on a cross, he really rose from the dead and he's coming back, Okay, if you believe those things, well, then we welcome you to have communion. Even if you don't regularly come here, you're visiting, we'd welcome you to have communion if that's what you want to, pray, uh, you want to declare. Because every time we have communion, we redeclare the gospel, the story of Jesus. We rediscover it. We recommit ourselves to it. We recelebrate it. And we ask God to let that be that which defines who we are. Because we are in God, in Christ. Who I used to be died. I want him to, I want him to die all over again. And I want something new to come. And so we're going to invite you to have communion. I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward, the people who are preparing communion. And let me just give you just a little instructions for here and in the theater. Basically, do what the ushers say, all right? And so uh, we've got some ushers up front who will help you. There'll be some in the aisles. They'll dismiss you by rows. I know here in the worship center, you're going to come down center, go around. You're going to come and go back around. The ushers will direct you in the theater. There's a little other directions. There's some arrows here that will work for the worship center. Uh, the theater, follow the directions of your ushers in that. Um, and when you come, you can take the bread, take the cup. You can take it right away. You can take it back to your seat. We won't be taking it all together, but you're welcome to come to communion. Let's pray together and prepare our hearts, Father. Father, Father, thank you that we have the promise of Christ. We are in Christ. We are in God and in Christ. Thank you that what that means is that we don't have to define ourselves. We don't have to have the pressure to be something that matters or something that's significant. You have given us the position of significance as your son and as your daughter, and you are making us into something beautiful. We have been given identity in Christ and a future destiny in Christ. And that is more than we could ever imagine. We desperately need to refocus on that, rediscover that. We need to set our minds on the gospel message and things above and we would just ask, Holy Spirit, for you to come to us right now and speak to our spirit, speak to our heart about anything that needs to be put off. It is a miracle, Holy Spirit, that you are interacting with every single person in this room as though they're the only person in this room. And right now, in Jesus' name, you're saying some very specific things to some people about some things that they just need to confess, they need to drag in the light, some things they got to talk to some people about, some relationships, some forgiveness that's got to be given. Father God, I just pray that, that your spirit would just work. And that as people have communion, they would just be resolved to just, just obey in whatever way. It might be the changing the way we talk, what we're watching on TV, what we're setting our hearts by, the, the, the inattention we've had to prayer and devotion. We just ask you, Father God, to help us just to put all that off. Just imagine 
just help us imagine taking off an old, smelly, heavy, wet, burdensome, burdensome cloak, and it just falls off. And we're amazed to see that already in Christ, we are white and we are clean, and we will now put on Christ, the glorious, glorious person of Christ. Help us begin to understand what that means. So as we come to this communion, Father, may we come with joy, may we come with anticipation, remembering that there's a God who loves us and knows our name and written our names down in heaven, that we are given a promise, that we've given a new name, a new identity. We don't even fully understand what it means now, but it will be revealed when you are revealed. It will be your masterpiece. That is our destiny in Christ. May we come now celebrating it, moving towards it, embracing it, even as we do it now. In Jesus' name, amen. I encourage you, come to communion.